From the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, hello and welcome to our civic series, Race to City Hall. My name is Seth Pinsky and I'm the CEO of the 92nd Street Y. I'm honored to be here to host these one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading mayoral candidates covering topics of importance to all New Yorkers, including some suggested by members of our 92nd Street Y community. Thank you all so much for joining us. As we all know, the last year has been an amazingly difficult one for the city that we call home. To overcome our challenges, it's going to take a decisive, collaborative, and creative chief executive. Who our next mayor is, therefore, will chart the course for our city, not just as we struggle to emerge from our current crises, but for many, many years to come. It's for this reason that we at the 92nd Street Y have launched this series. Today, I'm speaking with mayoral candidate Eric Adams, the borough president of Brooklyn. Borough President Adams formally announced his run for mayor in November. For the last eight years, he's served in his current role. And before that, he served in the state Senate in Albany after completing a 22 year career in the NYPD. Borough President, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you and to uh, all of the of folks out there from the 92nd Street Y, uh, you know, hello, and I'm excited to be here and engage in this conversation that we are going to have. Well, that's great. Um, and before diving into some weightier topics, I wanted to ask you uh, one quick question. Um, I heard uh, when the pandemic first hit that you actually dragged a mattress into your office at Borough Hall and slept at Borough Hall to keep your finger on the pulse of what was going on in the borough. I just am curious, since those dark early days, how are you doing? How's your family doing? I hope everyone is okay. Uh, yes, and also that same question to you, you and your family. And yes, because, you know, uh, Seth, I, I learned from my days in law enforcement that uh, leadership is not only substantive, it's symbolic. And um, after 9-11, uh, when the Trade Center was attacked, uh, I slept in the precinct so I could get up and respond uh, to the emergency. We were unaware if there was going to be an attack immediately after, and I wanted to be prepared. And that's how I felt when COVID hit our city and we de decided to shut down. I created a command center at Borough Hall. I was able to respond immediately. A lot of people fled. Uh, I knew I had to play the role to lead. And I did a command center there and deployed resources, PPE, food, uh, I was able to coordinate with my staff that was, uh, they were remote um, working, uh, but at the same time, uh, I did not want to infect my family because I was going to and from on the ground to NYCHA, to hospitals, to senior centers, transit employees. And so I felt that if I just stay in that same mode that I stayed in as a police officer, a lieutenant during 9-11, uh, I can function better, and at the same time, I wouldn't put my family in harm's way. And, I, and it was a smart move, it was the right move, it allowed me to keep my finger on the pulse. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, that you and your family are doing better, and I'm glad to hear that at least we've gotten to the point where you don't need to spend 24 hours a day, <laughs> seven days a week in your office. Yes. Um, it, you mentioned your experience as a police officer, and that, that provides a nice segue into the first topic that I wanted to cover. Um, and um, leading up to this conversation, we went out to our community and asked them uh, what questions they would want me to ask of you. And um, what was interesting was that one of the key topics that many seem to be focused on right now is, is policing. Um, but what was even more interesting was that the questions that we received generally fell into two very different camps. Um, the first camp was something like this. Um, murder was up 40% last year shootings doubled last year. The city is out of control. Um, we need to fund and empower the police department as quickly as possible, and we need to staunch this tide immediately. So that was one camp. And then the second camp was, yes, crime is rising and, and that's concerning, but the answer isn't more policing. The NYPD has a history of racial bias. Um, it doesn't solve the underlying problems. Um, when it comes to the NYPD, our priority should be reform. And when it comes to crime, the priority should be taking some of the money away from the police department and putting it into our social service agencies. So among the, the candidates for mayor, you're in a unique position when it comes to this topic. Um, as you mentioned, 
You were for many, many years an NYPD officer. Um, and you're also a black man who talks about having been victimized uh, when you were younger in South Jamaica um, by police officers. So I, I guess I'm curious to get your perspective on this. Um, is this an either or proposition um, or can we do both? Can we fight crime and reform the police department? And if so, how? Great question. And I, I, I am not a poster, but I bet you if you would uh, divide, uh, divide the responses, uh, a more younger group would have stated uh, the parts that we need to defund the police uh, because of their over aggressive behavior and an older group would probably be more conservative about dealing with the issue of crime. Uh, because it depends on your experience here in the city. It would really weigh your position around law enforcement. Uh, let's be clear. Uh, we couldn't always walk through Central Park and Prospect Park. Williamsburg wasn't always a place where hipsters hung out. Uh, there was a different city uh, during the early, eight, the mid eighties when I policed in this city. We were having 2000 homicides a year, uh, almost 98,000 robberies, an equivalent amount of felonious, felonious assaults, graffiti was everywhere. And when you look at uh, many New Yorkers who live through that, uh, when they see open defecation, open urination, people openly using drugs on their street corners, uh, shootings, one-year-old children being shot and killed, uh, they are thinking, we can't go backwards. And I'm, I'm clear on this. My son is not growing up in the city that I grew up in where crime was the norm. But at the same time, I have a different perspective and a very unique perspective from everyone that, was, that, that is running for mayor. I was arrested at 15. I was beat uh, bad by police officers and uh, I, I was traumatized. And I lived through the PTSD of that experience uh, for many years until civil rights activists uh, encouraged me to go into law enforcement and really uh, reform from within. And what I learned from the 22 years of being a police officer and retiring as a captain is that we can have justice and public safety at the same time. They go together. Public safety is the prerequisite to prosperity. We will not exist in the city if we are not safe. And what we must do is redefine the ecosystem of public safety in the city. And that's, those are the experiences uh, that I'm going to bring uh, to our police department. I will have the back of my police, but my police will have the back of the New Yorkers they serve of this one to serve and protect. And so I understand those who say the police have gone too far. And I also understand those who are saying our city has gone too far backwards um, when you look at the crimes and the, particularly the increase in murders in the city. And, and for President, I guess just to, to get a little more specific, how exactly do you do that? How do you make the police department feel as if the mayor is supporting them and um, to use your phrase, has their back, but at the same time, um, institute more discipline to make sure that when police officers go astray, um, that um, there are serious consequences. Because I have been in the agency and much of my career was as a supervisor, uh, there are parts of the agency that many people don't know. Uh, one of the most well-kept secrets is that Everyday officers dislike abusive officers. I cannot tell you the number of times that a police officer came to me as a sergeant, a lieutenant, or a captain and said, uh, sir, I don't want to go out with this officer. Uh, I just don't feel comfortable going on patrol with him. What has happened historically is that police agencies in New York and across America, they have become safe havens for abusive officers. There are no real systems in place to immediately identify who they are and have them removed from the department, retrained or proper discipline. Like we just had an inspector that was just fired uh, yesterday uh, because he was posting a uh, racist, uh, 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 anti-black uh, and anti-other groups on a website. We didn't wait four years like we did with Penaleo to get rid of him. We immediately, put him through the departmental trial and removed him from service immediately. That is what you must do. 
We have held on to bad acting police officers for too long, and it has created a culture within the police department that no one is removing these bad guys. No one believes in the internal investigatory systems that are in place. If we don't change the culture from within and have officers uh, that want to do the job of, being, of, of, of protecting our city, if we don't create that environment, then we're not going to ever change the culture. And that is what I would do as mayor. Uh, no more long-term uh, holding those officers that have serious misconduct, holding them for years. You have officers with serious mis misconduct standing in the department for years, going back to patrol with serious abusive records, and we continue to allow them to fester. We have to immediately stop that, expedite departmental trials, remove them, retrain them or proper instruction, and we have to set the right climate uh, that those officers that want to do the job can do it uh, free of those officers that are taking down what I consider to be the nobility of policing. Something is noble, Seth, about running into a building when someone is discharging a weapon or going after someone uh, who's holding someone hostage. There's a level of nobility attached to that, and we have destroyed that nobility by not removing those officers that are not suitable uh, to wear uh, the uniform of a police officer. Um, thank you for that answer. Um, I, I want to pick up on something that you um, brought up in uh, your response, which was that you talked about how public safety is, um, I forget the exact phrasing, but at the foundation of our prosperity. And um, another very serious challenge that we in New York face is um, that our very prosperity um, is at risk. Um, uh, on your campaign website, you discuss the serious economic hole in which we find ourselves. As you know, um, even though we've rebounded from the lows of earlier last year, we're down half a million jobs in the city. Our unemployment rate at 12% is twice the national unemployment rate. Um, and as you and, and, and many of your competitors in the mayoral race point out, we desperately need to restart the city's economic engine. We have to create new jobs for all New Yorkers, but we especially have to focus on industries like hospitality that, that have been decimated, on communities like our communities of color that have been decimated. So I guess the, the next question that I have for you is, um, if tomorrow you were elected mayor and uh, you were sworn in the day after, what would be the, the first three very specific steps that you would take to try to jumpstart the economy? Uh, uh, specifically, I would immediately reinstitute the uh, anti-crime units in the police department. Uh, because in order to jumpstart our economy, uh, two things must take place. Public health, we, have, we must get COVID under control and public safety. I will immediately reinstitute the anti-crime unit, turn them into an anti-gun unit, and we will uh, activate precision policing, go after the gun violence, and go after the gang members in the city, and we will stop the flow of guns in our city. We have an overproliferation of handguns in our city because every time there's a shooting, it not only devastates the families who are impacted, the community, that's impacted, but it also impacts our tourism. When Channel 5 reports a shooting in New York City, it impacts tourism, a multi-billion dollar industry that if we don't get it back up and running, uh, we're going to have a major problem. And so I will immediately have my police department zero in on dealing with uh, gun violence and gun crime. A second thing I would do is to put in place clear standards for our office buildings to get them back up and running. Uh, there have been some ex excellent examples of places like Related, RxR, and others where they have created a safe space for their employees with clear standards, but the city and state, uh, they have yet to hand down to our companies and our business districts what are the clear standards that we expect? Because we can't have frivolous lawsuits uh, that would happen because people get COVID-19 because there are not clear standards on what buildings should do, how they should operate, uh, should operate. We must get the city back up and running. If I don't have uh, people in those office buildings, they're not going to go down to the cafes, the cafeterias. They're not going to get their shoes shined. They're not going to feed 
uh, the other part of this ecosystem where low skill, low educated um, employees are, we have to get out our employees back in, in the buildings. And I will immediately give those standards. I'll bring in all my business leaders and I would tell them it's time to open our city. It's time to get our city functioning again. I would move and sit down with the governor and say, I need for us to increase 50% capacity in our restaurants because I know what it is to be employed in a restaurant. It's not just for rich people. I was a dishwasher as a child. I am saying, let's get our restaurants back open in a safe way and ensure, ensure that, it, that, that it is done uh, immediately and, and right away. And, and third, which is extremely uh, important, um, even prior to COVID, we had 200,000 jobs that were available and we did not have uh, people to fill those jobs. So we're not only looking at a, you know, an employment problem, we're looking at a skills problem. We have to match the availability of jobs and create a pipeline of skills uh, that can uh, uh, give young people and other people who are seeking jobs to fill the jobs that are available in this city. And I will immediately match with my, with my business community, the jobs that are available and those who are seeking jobs. We have to get the city back to work. And lastly, uh, Seth, uh, part of the stimulus that comes from the federal government can't do what the first two uh, versions of it did and focus on large corporations, many who didn't need it. Uh, I was zero in on our small businesses. 51% of our employees come from small businesses. Uh, we will energize them, give them the assistance they need around rent assist assistance, around having a more flexible use of the PPP that comes down so they can use it to get keep their doors open in a real way. And, and when you think about small businesses, and one thing that um, I hear a lot is that um, one of the biggest challenges that small businesses face is the city itself. Um, the taxes are high, the penalties and um, uh, various uh, rules and regulations make it very difficult to operate. Um, when you've been out on the campaign trail talking to small business owners, are there things that you've heard that you thought to yourself, this has to change and, and what are those? Very excited about that. And when you look at my 100 step forwards document and I encourage um, um, everyone from the 92nd Street Y to go to my website, uh, Eric Adams 2021, and look at my 100 step forward document. You know, if you sit in a room with one small business, Seth, and uh, they tell you a problem they're having, you can say, okay, maybe that's a unique case. But when you start to go from borough to borough, neighborhood to neighborhood, small business to small business, and they're saying the same thing, you have to scratch your head. <laughs> you know, something is wrong here. You remember you used to, you used to uh, travel across the uh, George Washington Bridge or down uh, Highway uh, 87, and you will say, welcome to the Empire State. Someone must have crossed out that line. We, we destroy empires in our city. Businesses should not be afraid to go to city, to the city agencies to get the help they need. It, you should not need an expediter to navigate the Department of Building. You should not need some expert to help you fill out the documents. We need to create a central platform of data where what I call a a city card, as I talk about on my 100 Step Forward. Once a business fills out forms and documentations of basic information, that information be, should be shared across agencies. So every time a business goes in, uh, he or she should not have to refill out the same forms again. That's an antiquated system. And then we need to judge our agencies. Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Buildings, uh, FDNY, all of our agencies should be judged not based on how do you stop business, but how many businesses have you assisted to stay open? Let's stop having a distraction from the mission. The mission is to start small businesses so they can employ the 51% of employees that they do and we need to be focused on keeping your doors open. That is not what we're focusing on right now. We don't judge 
our agencies based on their abilities to keep businesses going. We judge them with the, with the wrong metrics. We judge them on how many fines have you uh, issued? Uh, how many business have you shut down? How many stop work orders have you put in place? That is the wrong way to go. We need to unify the mission of the city and the mission should be to keep businesses open, keep people employed, to make sure that we are there, that businesses look forward to interacting with our city agencies. Government has no business being in our business and destroying the growth of businesses in this city. No one wants to do business in New York, too expensive, too challenging, too difficult, too much bureaucracy. We need to streamline and change that. And that is what I'm going to do as the mayor of the city of New York. So, so let me ask this, um, because your answer is an interesting one and it, it certainly contrasts you with some of the other members of the Democratic Party in New York today in that you talk a lot about partnership with business. Um, you have a more pro-business, pro-growth um, political position. Um, unlike some of your competitors, um, you haven't rejected, for example, contributions from real estate developers. Um, you've been very vocal in supporting some controversial development projects, most recently like uh, Industry City and Sunset Park. Um, and to a certain extent, um, everything that you're saying, at least to me, makes a lot of sense. You need to work with the private sector to generate jobs. But at the same time, um, what's also clear is that as the city has boomed over the last couple of decades, there have been thousands of longtime residents um, who were priced out of their homes, um, who were forced to move out of the city or elsewhere in the city. Um, and it's also clear that in many cases, the promises that were made to communities, whether it's by developers or government, about the benefits that would accrue to the incumbent residents if uh, growth were to occur, they never were delivered. And so um, my question to you is, um, you know, given the long history of broken promises or at least disappointments, what makes you so convinced that it's possible to develop and to grow our economy working in partnership um, with business without displacing longtime residents? And, more specifically, can you give an example of either a period in New York's history or somewhere else in the country where you see people doing this right, where there's growth and prosperity, but not at the cost of the most vulnerable members of society? Great question, uh, Seth. And uh, no, you can't, uh, because all over our country, uh, there has been this big mistake and divide uh, that uh, business uh, exists in one part of the city, and those who are in need exist in another. And I've, I've crisscrossed this country and examined, examined uh, how cities are interacting. And we've, we have just uh, made a mistake of not understanding there's some things that government uh, is capable of doing well, and, and, and there's some things that government, uh, they are not able to do well. And when you partner with businesses and the business community to come in and say, let's do this in a partnership, uh, you would get a better result. Uh, everything from our educational system, uh, why don't we have uh, prominent business leaders coming in and helping us with our curriculum? The reason children go to school, the reason taxpayers spend $350,000 per student uh, from K to 12 is so that one day they can go out and start a business or get employed somewhere. So if we're looking for that as the end result, why don't we have businesses in helping with the curriculum to say what they expect of, of our young people? Not only that, some of the best leadership training you see in this city come from our corporate community. Why aren't we allowing those uh, leadership trainers and skills uh, to uh, be issued to our police departments so we can train our, our captains and lieutenants and commanders to have real leadership skills, uh, motivational skills, and some of the tools of running an agency as important as the police department. Instead of bringing in our business community, we have alienated our business community. And many of our business leaders, uh, they have basically alienated of the communities uh, that they need to be in part of the city. You know, I tell my business leaders all the time, uh, we are stockholders. Stockholders are in this together. And historically, our business community has embraced the attitude 
that we would stay out of government, we would just run our businesses the best way we can, pay our tax dollars, and just you know don't see the need of government. That's a big mistake. We are in this together. A dysfunctional city is going to weigh on all of us, and even people from this organization of 92nd uh, Street Y. Let's be honest. For the most part, of they and 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 even. I am insulated from the real dysfunctionality of our city. We don't, we don't live in the NYCHA developments where lead paint is everywhere and roofs are leaking. Uh, my son went to American University. He didn't have to go through uh, some of the failing educational uh, uh, programs in the city. Uh, we basically stated we we'll pay our taxes, let government do what it's supposed to do. That was the wrong approach. We're stockholders. We must demand that government is doing its job. And part of that is to partner with our business community. And I believe it's possible. I know it's possible because I've done some joint partnerships. One in particular that jumps off at me is what I did at Democracy Academy. I partnered with Farm Shelf to, be, to bring uh, new technology and growing healthy foods in an alternative high school. Uh, we uh, brought in uh, this new state-of-the-art technology where you can grow food using hydroponics. It encouraged these children. They got engaged. They started dealing with food deserts in their community. Uh, and it was due to that partnership that we were able to carry this out. And there are far other examples of the partnerships we have been able to do in the city of, in, in the borough of Brooklyn. Um, so, so let me switch for a second from um, the theme of unity and collaboration to um, something that often leads to divisiveness and that is figuring out how to close a budget deficit. Um, the mayor's own January budget plan says that um, if you're elected mayor next year, you're going to inherit a budget gap of over $4 billion, and that that $4 billion budget gap basically exists for as far out as the projections go. Um, and there are groups like the Citizens Budget Commission, which look at the budget and say that $4 billion is really a $5 billion hole, so it's even worse. Um, given that in the city's budget of $92 billion, um, almost $20 billion of that goes to pensions and to debt service uh, costs, neither of which by law can be touched. How do you plan to close a four to five plus billion dollar gap um, in a way that is gonna be politically viable? And what I really wanna understand with some specificity is um, if the idea is to cut what gets cut? And if the idea is to generate revenues, how much do you think you can generate and from whom? Uh, great question, uh, Seth. And, and really that's the challenge. And, and if I could just take a step back for a moment, uh, for the last uh, two and a half years, uh, I have been sitting down with um, some of the smartest people in different industry areas, uh, everything from housing uh, to homelessness, education, healthcare, uh, de uh, development, uh, and uh, uh, finance. Uh, and we really, uh, we meet every morning from eight to nine, nine to 10. We've, we've met with over 250 people uh, just to engage in real conversations. Some of them former deputy mayors, uh, former commissioners. I find that people that are in government, ha they have an opportunity to reflect on government and say, um, what, do we, what do we do to do a better job? What did we go wrong? And budgeting is one of them. Uh, the first thing that we would do is uh, reduce, uh, significantly to reduce our labor costs through attrition. Uh, I think Bloomberg was smart. He did an excellent job. As people left, uh, he, we were able to save uh, almost $1.5 billion just through attrition. Uh, you know, in the last seven years, this mayor has increased the budget by $20 billion. I don't know where, where that money has gone to. And so I think that we could decrease the workforce without hurting uh, those uh, employees who are there. I know a lot of people say, let's just lay off, let's just lay off. And I want, I want to talk about that for a moment because I believe that's a big mistake. I also think we could save about $500 million uh, annually uh, through looking at um, the police department. Uh, we have an overbloated bureaucracy in all of our agencies. The police department is one of them. Uh, there's no reason we have overtime at the capacity that we do. We can strategically civilianize our police department. We have far too many officers who should be doing 
on public protection. Instead, they're doing clerical duties. It's more expensive to have a police officer do a clerical assignment than it is for a civilian. And I think we need to go through the department and civilianize the department, do a better job with overtime. Many of our officers spend five and six hours in the court waiting to testify. That shouldn't continue to happen. We should use technology like Zoom, WebEx, and have them just testify for the moment that we need them, resume patrol, or get off overtime that is costing us far too much money. And we don't need large number of police um, where a lot of overtime goes to pr parades and other festivities. Uh, we have a great auxiliary service that costs us nothing. We could deputize, deputize civilians at a low cost, our explorers and other volunteers to do the job just as well. And we will save hundreds of millions of dollars. And then uh, I believe as much as people don't want to talk about, talk about it, uh, we really need to look at a small increase in property tax, um, and not property tax, in uh, taxing of uh, those who are making $5 million or more. And it doesn't have to be uh, for five, six years. I think for one to two years to get us out of this deficit, that can generate anywhere from one to $2 billion a year. And then I think that the uh, Mayor Bloomberg was right with the PEG program. As I stated, this administration has increased the budget by $20 billion. Every agency can go in and find three to 5% cut in every agency. I will find it and we can still run our agencies in an effective way. That would save us a several billion dollars long-term, not just in, in, in one year at the same time. And then we need to find growth. Uh, the city needs to grow. We need to do what Miami is doing, what New Jersey is doing, others are doing. Uh, we need to encourage businesses to come to the city. This should be the center for life science, the center for cybersecurity, the center uh, for a new agrarian uh, economy, the partnership we're doing with NYU Business Center and Cornell University. Uh, this should be the center for in innovation. Uh, remember, uh, new cities compete for people. You want people to come here for school, stay here for employment and raise families and retire here. And so we must do everything possible to attract people here and you attract them here with job opportunities and opportunities for their family. We can close the budget if we run a more efficient city. And I say this over and over again, we are dysfunctional as a city. Cities are made up of agencies and our agencies in New York and across America we feed the crises that cause the hemorrhaging of taxpayers' dollars, and we can do a better job. Yeah, I, I just want to pick up on one thing that you said. You talked about a, a small increase on uh, in income taxes on, on people earning over five million dollars. Um, I mean, I grew up in a house where the greatest compliment you could give to a politician was that they were liberal. Um, and so there's something um, that seems right about the idea of taxing the wealthy if you have a large budget deficit. But I'm also very much aware of the fact that something like 40,000 taxpayers pay uh, around $5 billion a year in personal income tax. And um, a lot of them have learned during the pandemic that they don't need to be in New York. Um, and you know, if you lost just 10,000 of those taxpayers, you'd lose a billion and a quarter dollars every year. So I guess the question that I have is, even if it seems like the right quote unquote thing to do, how can you be sure that in raising taxes on the population that you're describing, we're not gonna end up in a worse position than we'd otherwise be in because we're driving these people out of New York? And I agree, Seth. Let me tell you, I hate the thought of raising taxes, and it should be the last result. Result. Uh, resort. Uh, it's not lost on me that sixty-five thousand uh, New Yorkers uh, pay uh, fifty-one percent of our income tax, and the only two percent of our income tax filers. Uh, I'm clear on that, and I know that uh, this is a moment of reaching out to those New Yorkers and saying, "We need you right now, uh, just as we needed you in the '70s." Uh, when some of the great leaders came together with our unions and other business leaders and developers and property owners. Uh, we needed after 9-11, uh, clearly we saw uh, the need to do a slight increase. I think Mayor Bloomberg was right when he did it. Uh, we needed it in 2008 um, after the financial crisis. And we're here again. And I would be disingenuous to say 
uh, to those uh, affluent New Yorkers who are making $5 million or more that we're going to need you uh, for a period of time. I don't believe in the mindset of demonizing uh, affluent people who are successful in business, uh, but I do uh, say uh, during this time, for uh, anywhere from two to three years, uh, we need an increase to help us get through this. But I say at the same time, when I speak with my affluent New Yorkers, uh, they, they don't say, Eric, we're not willing to do our share, but darn it, we wanna do our share and make sure the money we are putting into the city is being used correctly. How do we have a Department of Education with 65% of black children don't meet proficiency every year, and we're asking people to continue to put into uh, that multi-billion dollar budget. So the problem is not um, from these New Yorkers who are doing well, who love this city, uh, that they have to pay their share. The problem is they're tired of seeing their share being misused, and we're not seeing the results that we expect from this city. And so I know there's a threat of losing those New Yorkers uh, who are uh, high income earners. I know many have uh, realized that they can operate uh, remotely. I understand that, but right now we're in a tough time. And I think there are far too far more New Yorkers that believe in this city and know that this city has been good to them and their families. And we need to get through this together as we got through the seventies, as we got through 9-11, as we got through 2000, 2008, we can get through COVID. Um, let me switch gears and, and just touch uh, before we're, we're done on, on one other uh, crisis area, as if this weren't already enough. Um, the industry that the 92nd Street Y is in, the arts, entertainment, and culture industry um, has really been decimated uh, by COVID-19. The statistics are that citywide, we lost something like 20% of our jobs um, when COVID first hit. Um, and since then, we've recovered about 30% of what we've lost. So um, we're still down, but we're, we're, um, we're up from the bottom. In the arts, culture, and uh, recreation sector, um, we lost 70% of our jobs, and we've only recovered 5% of those jobs subsequently. And I can say, um, uh, running a, a large organization that um, the challenges continue, um, and they're likely to continue for some time. So um, the, the question that I wanted to ask you is, um, first of all, given all of the many problems that we have um, as a city, how do you um, say to the, the public at large that this is a sector that we should even be caring about at this moment? Um, and assuming that you can answer that question, what specifically would you do to try to help get our sector back up on its feet? You know, uh, we've made a big mistake uh, historically when we talk about uh, arts and culture, uh, just as we do when we talk about uh, parks and open space. The science is clear. When you examine the social determinants of health, when you examine uh, the crises we are about to experience uh, cycling uh, out of COVID-19. Arts right now, the role that art, play, art plays is not a luxury. <laughs> you can't even quantify uh, the importance that art is going to play on this city as we cycled out. Mental health crises are real. And that is why uh, during the Great Depression, uh, the federal government invested $27 million in art, music, and performances. Uh, that's equivalent to $400 million a day. We need to see the connectivity between the arts and culture and how it must play a role in our recovery, not just as it is a separate part of it. And I, at the heart of everything I say and do, Seth, is that one solution must solve a multitude of problems. And so if we put real stimulus into our arts and cultures, community, what we're going to do, number one, we're going to deal with the economics and employment that you're talking about. Number two, we're going to reinfuse uh, the tourism in the city. And number three, we're going to deal with the mental health aspect of it. The Center for the Study of Traumatic Stress uh, stated, and I, I, when I read through this, it was really interesting, uh, that uh, 
or through art such as painting, drawing, performances. It allows patients to put painful memories uh, into context and find meaning uh, in it, which leads to faster recovery. So we must look at the arts as part of our recovery. One, the government uh, should make sure that we do it uh, in a fair way, in a just way. I think that we should infuse real financial resources as part of the recovery that all of our students are participating in real uh, art experiences. We have too many young people who uh, never leave their block. We have children in Brownsville, African-American who have never left uh, their public housing uh, that they live in and where they're from. So we need to also look at the small art centers and, and locations. We many times focus on our big guys, our big museums, our Lincoln centers and other entities, but we need to look towards the 92nd Street Y. We need to look towards the Mercado Museum, all of these small local entities and engage people, but it's going to take financial resources. I think that we need to go on this amazing uh, artistic experience over the next uh, year, throughout uh, 2021, where every school uh, we need to build into the chancellor's room, where every school visits, every cultural institution, uh, the Department of Education infuse dollars into uh, this entity uh, to pay to keep these spaces uh, open, subsidized. We need to have a massive, with our 1.1 million students, we need to have a massive regeneration of art in this city coming out of the dark ages of COVID-19. And I think that the federal government should play a role with the dollars that come, come down from the stimulus, as well as the state, as well as the city. We should be subsidizing as many visits as possible, every arts and culture location throughout this city, from the local ones to the large ones. And then I need my big guys of um, you know, the, the big major cultural institutions, I need for them to play a major role to dig into uh, our communities, go beyond the safety of the Fifth Avenue mile. I need for them to go into every part of this, this city, South Jamaica, Queens, Brownsville, South Bronx, and really have a new energy of artistic energy as people overcome of the trauma that's associated with COVID-19. But, but let, me, let me just a ask this follow-up question. I mean, as the CEO of an organization that uh, each year educates, provides arts education for 15,000 almost exclusively low-income New Yorkers from across the five boroughs, New York City students, I'm sorry, from across the five boroughs in our public schools, um, hearing what you're saying thrills me. Um, and it's great to hear a mayoral candidate talk about the importance of arts education. But we've been seeing um, arts education cut over time um, for decades. And um, we're now in an environment where it's not clear that we're gonna have the money that we need to buy school books. And our kids aren't even getting basic educations because half of them or more than half of them are remote. In that environment, where do you find the money to do the things that you're talking about? Uh, even if there are, they are both incredibly important and the right goals to have? First of all, we need to prioritize uh, what are the needs. And you and I know, uh, you, you are uh, very familiar with the Dep Department of Education. It's an overbloated bureaucracy, layers and layers of people, layers and layers of duplication. Some of the worst procurement uh, rules uh, the waste and mismanagement in the Department of Education is, is something that needs to be examined. We have the money there. The problem is we have the lack of desire to go in and see that we don't need uh, to have uh, assistance to assistance, that assistance of the assistance. It's time to go into that agency and focus on education, as I always say, uh, from prenatal to career. And part of the focus of that is developing the full personhood of children. And you cannot develop the full personhood of children if you ignore the artistic points of that. We are not raising robots. We're ro raising young people who must become creative adults. 
And we need to refocus what we, we are doing and how we are allocating and spending dollars in the Department of Education. And that is what my chancellor is going to do. My mission will be clear. We're going to develop well-rounded children that will develop their full personhoods. And you can't do it without art, without health, without recreation, and without the ability to be prepared for art artificial intelligent a job market that we are we are about to face. So uh, let me let me uh, uh, close because we're we're running uh, short on time with uh, just one additional question that was asked by um, members of our community, and I guess it's it's kind of the elephant in the room whenever you're talking to somebody who's running for mayor of the city, which is um, that while many New York City residents assume that the mayor controls everything, in a lot of ways, um, the real puppet master is uh, the governor and the state. And there's much that the mayor can't do without the support of the state. Um, the members of our community are wondering, how do you feel that you're gonna be able to navigate that very challenging dynamic? And um, what gives you confidence and what should give us confidence that the relationship that you're gonna have with the state will be better than the relationship that currently exists between City Hall and uh, the governor's mansion? And you're so right, Seth, and whoever gave you that question is correct. Uh, navigating Albany is a challenge, uh, and we're going to do our best to use all of our relationships uh, in Albany uh, to fight for New York. Uh, but I'll tell you, like my mother said, uh, boy, you better have a plan B. And the real plan B is how are we going to utilize our agencies to do the job. And let me, let me, let me tell you uh, this for a moment. And this is something uh, that I really want New Yorkers to understand. Our city is dysfunctional, Seth. We create our crises. We, we often talk about the tale of two cities. We're the author. Cities are made up of agencies. And if those agencies are not aligned with the same mission, then they would just create crises. How do we have a Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, for example, spending millions of dollars to fight childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, childhood asthma? But every day, the Department of Education, they feed our children 960,000 meals a day. And those meals cause childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, childhood asthma. So yes, I want help from the state to give us money and have the fair education that we fought for under CFB. But at the same time, I'm going to call on my agencies that are within my span of control, that you are going to sit down with the other agencies in the city, and you're going to ensure that we are not carrying out actions every day that feeds the crises of our city. How don't we have dyslexia training, uh, screening in all the schools in our city? 30% of the men and women at Rikers Island are potentially dyslexic. If we had early screening in our schools, we wouldn't have children believing they can't learn and then end up on, on Rikers Island. So since the Department of Education refused to do that, we are in conflict with our law enforcement issues in the city. And if you go from agency to agency, you will find that many of the conflicts we see in the city in the crises, they're created by other agencies. So yes, I want the dollars from the federal government. I'm, a, I'm going to fight for the dollars uh, from the state government, but we need to do our job here in the city, align our agencies, one mission, all moving together so that we can build this city and maximize what we have in this city. This is a great city. We have some of the best people, but we're dysfunctional because we no longer believe in the city and we no longer believe and expect from our agencies what they should be producing. We're the stockholders. We're doing our job of paying our taxes. Now it's time for government to do its job and using those taxes to run the city and just not spend those tax dollars in a wasteful way. And so I believe that New York can do this. The people in New York City, we can do a better job. We did it before. We turned around a dysfunctional policing apparatus where violence was considered to be the norm. We made our city safe. 
We can do it in a DOE, the Department of Building, FDNY, HRA. We can do the same thing in every city agency. And I believe that, and we can stop being a dysfunctional city and start functioning as a city that helps people who are in need. President Adams, thank you so much. Um, there's so much more ground to cover, but um, unfortunately we're out of, town, out of time. Um, I wanna thank you for giving us a glimpse into your plans for the city um, and to our 92nd Street Y patrons. I wanna say thank you so much for supporting and tuning into the Race for City Hall series. Uh, please check back on our website for the most up-to-date schedule on future conversations. And in the meantime, from the virtual stage of the 92nd Street Y, we're signing off and thank you for listening. Thank you, Borough President. Thank you.